So today we're going to go through the first part of Romans 10. If you have your Bible, take it out and turn there. But first I want to start off with a story. For me, an all too familiar story. From probably about six months ago. I come home from a day at work. And um, there's things that aren't yet done. Kids' chores that haven't been accomplished. Announcements that things are broken that dad needs to come fix. And I'm left frustrated. <sighs> I guess I just have to make this happen. Can anyone relate? Maybe it's not home, maybe it's work. Maybe you got a coworker that just can't quite keep up. Maybe it's personally, you're frustrated at yourself that you're just, well, not enough. Today, we have a word from, from Romans that I believe is going to speak directly to that. Because I can testify that the last couple months have changed and it's been different for me personally. And I believe the Lord wants to set you free too. And he wants to let you have more peace, more joy, more freedom. Amen? So turn with me. Romans 10, verse 1. <clears throat> Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, them being Israel, is that they may be saved. Remember, salvation is not just from hell, but from, from sin and from death currently affecting your life. Verse 3, for, being the, for I bear them witness, in verse 2, that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They're passionate people. They believe in the Lord, but some of their knowledge about who God is and who they are is not right. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God, they seek to establish their own, and they did not submit to God's righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Man, there's a lot of goodness in there. Let me just make some observations really quick. First, uh, they were ignorance of the righteousness of God. Remember, they were passionate people. They had zeal. Many of us in this room, if you're sitting in a church service on Sunday morning, you live in a culture that doesn't do that. There's some sort of a zeal in your heart for Jesus. The question is, is it according to God's knowledge of who he is and who you are, or is it a misplaced zeal? Because my friends, we are all able to misplace our zeal and call it righteousness. As we see in the next verse, they, because they did not understand God's righteousness, they sought to establish their own righteousness. And each one of us does the exact same thing. When we lose sight of who God is, we start to try to find a way to replace that God-sized hole with ourselves or with something else or someone else. And so we get into Romans 10, 6 through 8, and, and we're going to spend most of our time here today. Verse 6 
But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. If I'm honest, this is a passage that consistently for years, as I read it, I just kind of glossed over it because I didn't really get it. I read it and I would reread it. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, nah. Paul gets confusing. But, but this week, I, I read a commentary that I really felt like fleshed it out for me a little bit more. It said, here Paul quotes three phrases from Deuteronomy 30. And, and we don't have time to get into Deuteronomy today. All I can encourage you is if you don't read the Old Testament, you should. Because there is so much beauty in that section of the Bible, there is so many foundational truths that as you grasp them and understand them, it brings a greater depth, a greater foundation, and, and um, greater strength to your faith. So, so just encouragement, read through Deuteronomy if, if this affects you today, just to understand what's going on. In Deuteronomy 30, he says, and he's talking about the law, he applies these things that Moses talks about to the good news about Christ. He says, we do not need to go up to heaven to find Christ and thus be made right with God. Because God has already brought Christ down to earth as a man. Nor do we need to go down to the place of the dead to find Christ because God has already raised him from the dead. To find Christ, we must simply believe in the message that is close at hand. Both for Moses and the people of Israel and for us today. We keep trying to establish our own righteousness. This is where we get the concept self Righteousness. It's a righteousness that I can find in myself. And, and why do I do that? Well, simply because I can't get to God unless I'm good enough. I can't be successful unless I'm good enough. The things in my life will not prosper unless I'm good enough. And many of us live under the weight of that. But the reality is, is it is God's power and God's power alone that gives you the righteousness and raises you from the dead. And over the next amount of time we have together, I'm going to seek to unpack that for us. That it is God's power alone that is your righteousness and raises you from the dead and everybody else around you. First, let's dive into this concept of we have been given through God's righteousness. Um, we have been saved. It was part of the passage earlier in Romans. Salvation is not just when this life finally comes to an end, I get to spend eternity with God in heaven. Praise God. Eternal life is intended to start today. And we see that from Jesus in John 17. So let's turn to John 17 really quickly and let's read through some of this passage. If you're familiar with it, this is where Jesus is in the garden and he's praying to the Father. And he says this, and this is eternal life, that they would know you the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Eternal life is, number one, that you would know God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. Going to verse 11. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name. Evidence that you have eternal life, God is keeping you in his name. And that they may be one, even as I am one. 
evidence that God's righteousness is flowing through your life, that he is raising you from the dead, is that you are experiencing oneness with God and with those around you. Verse 13, but now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. Evidence that God is working in your life, that there is joy overflowing. Verse 15, I do not ask that you take them out of this world. God's plan is not just to rescue you into your holy little huddle but that he would keep you from the evil one in the midst of the world that you find yourself. Verse 16, they are not of this world just as I am not of this world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. When God is our righteousness, you are being sanctified by his truth. It is his word that is transforming you to look more like Jesus. And as you sent me, verse 18, as you sent me into the world, so I have also sent them into the world. As one that is experiencing the righteousness of Christ, you are living as a sent one. So let's just review these really quack, quick. Eternal life is that you would know God, that you would be one with God and with those around you, that you would have joy that is overflowing, that God would be keeping you from the evil one, that you would be sanctified by his truth and you would live as a sent one. Anyone living that way? All the time? Anybody? Anybody? No, right? So just in case you came here and you're like, I'm good, I'm righteous. I got the righteousness of Jesus. I'm good. I would argue Jesus has more for us. Amen? And part of the reason we come to this place, we gather together, is that we would be inspired, encouraged to love God and to trust him in greater ways. Now, I'm just warning you. I might step on some toes. Are you guys ready? Because listen, God has called you to so much more joy than you're currently walking in. He's called you into greater sentness, greater effectiveness in transforming the darkness and bringing light than we're currently walking in. Starting inside us, in our homes, and in our world. I want to show you this picture of a tree. Here you have a set of trees. They're all right next to each other. Yet clearly, the one on your right is not doing so well. Something is, something's wrong. Yet the one on the left seems like it's going fine. I'm a little crooked, but, you know, prospering, flourishing even. The challenging part is sometimes we live as the dead tree thinking that deadness is normal. And, and I'm hoping that today the Holy Spirit is going to challenge us that there is more life for you. And to do that, we're going to use these verses that we read in Romans. Um, and, and just in case you think that, no, no, really, Pastor, I'm good. Just because you started in the Spirit does not mean that you are continuing in the Spirit. Perhaps, like the Galatians, you are continuing in the flesh, and you have been bewitched. Now, the challenging with bewitchment is you don't know. You don't realize that you've gotten off until someone else is invited in to say, hey, I, I think something's a little off. So I'm asking that you would have an open mind today to say maybe in little 
or in great ways, I maybe have been bewitched. And maybe I'm not depending on Christ to be my righteousness. Going back to Romans 10, verse 6. But the righteousness based on faith, faith not in faith, but faith in Jesus, does not say who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down. My question to you today is, where have you been trying to ascend into heaven? Where have you been trying to live in your own righteousness? Towards others, towards yourself, or towards God? Has anybody been guilty of um, telling little white lies? Just little ones. I was talking to somebody here um, a couple weeks back, and they were describing their marriage, and they're saying they, they realize they were bewitched, they're coming into revelation, that they've spent their whole life lying to people. I remember in high school, I'm driving with my friend, his girlfriend calls. Oh, yeah, I'm like five minutes away. I look at him. I said, we are a good 20 minutes. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I'm just telling her what she wants to hear. <laughs> wants to hear? How's she going to feel in five minutes? <laughs> But my brother that I'm talking to just a couple weeks ago, same story. Hey, honey, how are you doing? Oh, I'm good. But you're not. Do you tell little white lies? Or maybe really big ones? Why is it that we feel a need to tell lies? My argument is that you are trying to ascend into heaven. You are trying to build a case for your righteousness with others because you want them to see you as good. So you're unwilling to just tell the, the truth that, oh, actually, I'm sorry, I left late again. And just be honest. And the need to tell them something that isn't true is the evidence that you're living in your own righteousness and not in God's righteousness. Because those that are living in God's righteousness, I don't care what you know about me. I'm an open book. We got people in this room right now, they're like, yep, I used to, I, I, I used to sell my body for money. But you know what? I don't do that anymore because God's redeemed me. We got people that said, yeah, I used to be an alcoholic. Yeah, I lost two marriages on that one. But you know what? God is healing me and I'm okay. I'm good because God is good. We got people that will say, yeah, I had a porn problem. Man, I spent a lot of money on that trash because I was looking for love. But you know what? That, that's not who I am anymore. Yet there are many of us in this room that if you were given the opportunity to be honest, you're not going to tell anybody. And that is the evidence that you're trying to be righteous in your own strength towards others. Unfortunately, it doesn't stop towards others. Because many of us have done this before. Uh, you did something wrong. Someone confronts you about it. You immediately put up walls of justification. Any guilty parties? I've been so guilty of this in the past. I have to watch myself. I, I, you know, immediately, I give you some explanation of why I'm not that bad. 
And if it was just about my righteousness in front of you, then in theory, when I left your presence, I'd forget about it. But then you spend the next five weeks continuing to rehearse the story of why you're not that bad. No one's even there to hear it. Who are you trying to convince? You're trying to ascend into heaven. You're trying to ascend and create your own self-righteousness for yourself. Oh, I don't, I, don't, I don't have a drinking problem. I can stop anytime. You sure about that? But maybe your sin of choice is um, less obvious. Maybe you're just angry. And you keep acting in anger. And your words cut and they hurt. But it's not that bad. Yeah. You know, like, there's fractures in your marriage because of this, right? Yeah, but yeah, I mean, I'm not. And then what do we inevitably do? It's, it's them, you know. And why do we point and blame? It's for the sake of us ascending to heaven and making ourselves look better. Because the thought that I would have to face the reality of my own mess does not compute because unless I'm righteous enough, no one else is. You see how that works? Let us not say, who's going to ascend into heaven to make myself righteous enough? Now, usually, if you have a habit of trying to make yourself righteous, that then gets transferred over to those around you. Because if Christ is not enough for me, that means Christ is not enough for you either. For your spouse, for your kids, for your neighbors, for your boss, for your coworkers. So then we take that same mindset and we say, well, then we have to make you more righteous. But usually we don't spend our time defending their actions. We just spend their, our time tearing them down and explaining to them just how unrighteous they are. So your marriage is withering because at the, at the base level, Christ is not enough for you. And because he's not enough for you, he's not enough for them. And while they're human, don't you know, just like you, and they have issues just like you, but their issues are getting in the way. And if they would just change in this small thing, I could whatever. Sound like anybody in the room? If they would just, that's the evidence. If you've said or thought, if they would just, that's the evidence that you are looking to something else to be your righteousness. Because for those of us that have experienced Christ as our righteousness, when you're living in that place, when you have right knowledge of God's righteousness and you're trusting in him, let me tell you, you see people's mess and you're like, I get it. <laughs> Guilty. Mine might look a little different, but man, we're, we're, we're all the same at the foot of the cross, man. We're, no judgment here. That doesn't mean I just step back and don't do anything about it. But my approach to them is one of grace and mercy. There is no other response. Because I've experienced the grace and the mercy. That's how you know you're living under God's righteousness. That's how you're not trying to ascend into heaven because Christ alone has ascended into heaven. 
Amen. Amen. Next part. Who shall we not say who will descend into the depths to bring Christ up from the grave? Where have you been guilty, perhaps, of trying to descend to resurrect dead things? In others, in yourself, or even with the Lord. You see, friends, Christ and Christ alone resurrects dead things. But so many of us don't really believe it. And so we spend our energies trying to raise the dead and getting more and more frustrated about it. And then that frustration bleeds into those relationships starting with our relationship with the Lord. Do I have any fixers in the room? Someone wanted to buy me a t-shirt that says, I know stuff and I fix things. And if I'm honest, amen. <laughs> That's right. And when I come up against problems, well, I'm going to fix it. Having some trouble with something in my house? Don't worry. Just tell dad. I'll fix it. And, you, and the truth is, God has given me grace. Most of the time, I can fix things. But the truth is, it's the grace of God, not me. And then I get so arrogant to think, well, if I can th fix things, I can fix people too, you know. So you find yourself saying things, oh, it's okay. I can help them. Or maybe this is your phrase. If they would just listen. Listen to who exactly? If you, if you would just listen to me, because I'm the author of all truth and goodness. Can anyone relate? <laughs> no pointing at your spouse. <laughs> that was funny. Okay. <laughs> now, many of you are pointing eternally. I know. I know. You don't resurrect dead things. For some of us, that looks like um, with your spouse. I think marriage is, is such an example of where God puts people in the fire together. And he says, watch, we're going to watch you grow. <laughs> we're making gold here. Turn up the heat. <laughs> because the relationship is close. I find that the closer you are to me, the more frustrated I get. Because the more I feel responsible to raise you from the dead. So the people I get the most angry at and the most frustrated at is the people that really are exposing the lie that I resurrected things. Think about it. Who have you been so frustrated at? It's the person that is exposing the lie. You don't resurrect dead things. To be really transparent, I spent most of my marriage trying to resurrect dead things. 
I've, I've spent way too many days coming home frustrated. But these last six months, something has changed, I would say. I come home, and oftentimes I'll, I'll sit down, and I'll just, instead of saying, why isn't this done, or why isn't that done, or why do we... I'll sit and I'll just start smiling. I like stare at my wife and I'm just smiling at her and she's like, what are you smiling at? I like you. <laughs> my kids are the ones, they really don't know what to do with it. They're like, why are you smiling at me? Because I like you. <laughs> now listen, ha has anything changed? I mean, it, I mean, everyone's growing a little bit, but no, the biggest thing that has changed is I've changed. And the, the way that it happened was I started applying the promises of God in prayer, not just to myself, but to the other people around me. Because did you know, if Christ can raise you from the dead, he's the only one that's going to raise them from the dead. I began to trust that God was who he said he was, not just in my life, but in their life. And what it did was it gave me freedom to take off the junior God hat <laughs> and to put on the, I'm a son of God and my father is going to fix it. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't parent. You know, my five-year-old does something crazy. Anybody got five-year-olds that are crazy? All boy, okay? He is all boy. He's just like, let's hit the glass mirror with something. Let's see what happens. You know, you're like, ah. So when, when you have the junior egg God hat on, when you're trying to resurrect dead things, you enter into that situation, oh my gosh, you don't say this. I'm failing as a parent because clearly, if I was a good parent, there's no way my kid would be acting like a five-year-old, right? <laughs> so you enter into the relationship with frustration and anger. Or maybe in your marriage, you enter into the relationship with frustration and anger. And it causes the relationship to wither, just like the tree on the right. The issue is not them. The issue is God is not your righteousness. And you do not actually fully believe that he resurrects dead things. Coming to ourselves. Do you ever try to raise yourself from the dead? Now, the people that probably understand this the most in the room are former addicts. Because as an addict, you've spent a long time saying, well, no, I, I'm not addicted. I can stop any time. And it's only when you came to the end of that lie that you realized, I can't. The truth of it, most of us are still addicted. We still think that we are going to fix all of our little problems. But because of the coupling of the righteousness of, of ourselves, we can't let anybody know about the problems and thus the lying and the hiding. Because, and it's okay to hide because don't worry, I'm going to fix it. What is the thing in your life that you're telling yourself you can fix it? Maybe it's addiction. Maybe you're in the middle of an affair right now. And you haven't told, I mean, you, I don't tell anybody about it. But you know what? I know it's wrong. I, I'm going to stop. Maybe your affair isn't with a person. Maybe your affair is with media and entertainment. You continually binge watch the things that you know is death. but I'm going to fix it. Because this is what the devil does. 
He lies to you in a very small way, and he says, did God really say? Is he really enough? Is his righteousness really enough? Is he, does he really have the power to raise you from the dead? To fix these problems? And he banks on the fact that you're not going to trust him at his word. You're going to look around you with your eyes of flesh, and you're going to say, well, clearly it's not happening yet. So I guess God isn't able or is unwilling. And then he invites you to say, well, then maybe you should be righteous enough. Or maybe you should resurrect it from the dead. But that inevitably fails because you're not God. You're not Jesus. Jesus alone is righteous, and Jesus alone has the power to raise from the dead. So then we go into self-condemnation. I failed. I failed again. I should just. And then you, you just start this downward spiral of more death and more destruction. And the devil's sitting back saying, I got you. The root of it is the answer to the question, who will ascend into heaven? And who will descend into the grave and raise Christ up? Romans 10, 9. It's the next verse. Anybody know Romans 10, 9? This is Romans Road, folks. A lot of us know this verse. We probably have it memorized. This is where it comes in the passage. After all that we just said, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What we need to do is confess that Jesus alone is Lord. His righteousness alone can justify you and can justify everybody around you. When God looks at you, he sees Christ's righteousness. But listen, you know and I know that you're not perfect yet. Could you have the eyes of God when you look at those around you to say, even though you're not perfect yet, I am going to see Christ's righteousness on you. And I'm going to see you as God sees you. So when you go to work and your boss is crazy, you don't think you're crazy. You think Christ is enough for you. And man, he's a mighty God. You confess with your mouth that God has risen Christ from the dead. That you would choose to believe. As we read earlier in the passage, you would submit yourself to God's righteousness. Even though you don't see it and you don't feel it, submission is not. I think that's a great idea. I'm going to follow along. Submission is saying, I don't think you're right, but I'm going to trust you. We are called to submit to God's righteousness, trusting that, you know what, God, your righteousness is enough for me and it's enough for them. And your power to raise from the dead is enough for me and it's enough for them. And I lay down the lie that I can be righteous enough or that I can raise it from the dead. So I want to end our time today with confession. Because I trust that the Holy Spirit is convicting hearts right now. Because we're all guilty. We're all guilty of trying to ascend into heaven. Trying to be good enough for ourselves. Trying to make others good enough for us. only to reap sin and death. 
And there likewise are times where we've decided I'm just going to have to descend into the dark places. I'm going to have to fix it. I'm going to have to raise it from the dead. I'm going to have to make it right. And in doing so, you've, you've only aggravated and frustrated everyone around you because you can't raise him from the dead. Only Jesus can.